Welcome to today's talk in Hitler's Munich, Jews, the Revolution and the Rise of Nazism. I'm Rachel Stern, Executive Director of the Fritz Usher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized and Banned Art based in New York. I'm now honored to introduce Michael Brenner, who holds the Chair of Jewish History and Culture at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. He's also a distinguished prof professor of history and Seymour and Lillian Abenson Chair in Israel Studies at American University and serves as international president of the Leo Beck Institute for the Study of German Jewish History. In 2021, he was the first recipient of the Baron Award for Scholarly Excellence in Research of the Jewish Experience. He's author of 10 books translated into over a dozen languages. His latest books are In Hitler's Munich, Jews, the Revolution and the Rise of Nazism, published by Princeton University Press in 2022, and In Search of Israel, the History of an Idea, also published by Princeton University Press in 2019. After the talk, there will be time for Q&A, so please post your questions in the chat function. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. And I see quite a number here, a big number of participants. Welcome, everyone. Unfortunately, I cannot see you. Um, and soon you won't see much of me either because I will share my <laughs> screen and hopefully you'll see the picture instead. And does that work? Yes. Uh, Okay, hey, good. Thank you. Okay, so today's topic is about the revolution uh, in Munich uh, of 1918-19 and the years following until Hitler's so-called Beer Hall Coach of 1923, almost exactly 100 years ago, a little more by now, November of 1923. And um, and what I would like to um, explore together with you, uh, you'll have, of course, time for questions in the end, um, is the Jewish role in all of that. And it is a actually quite a significant role, as we will see. I um, this is the topic of my my most recent book, which I will try to put into about 30, 35 minutes so we have enough space for your questions. So Munich, 1918, um, we start with act one of our presentation to today. Um, in November of 1918, um, a lot happened, of course, in German history the revolution in Berlin, the end of the monarchy of the Kaiser, of the German emperor, the beginning of the so-called Weimar Republic. Um, but many people forget that uh, in Munich, even two days earlier than the downfall of the German Kaiser, there was the downfall of the Bavarian king. Um, and the revolution that happened in Munich on November 7th, 1918, was a peaceful revolution, a revolution without any bloodshed, a revolution that was absolutely peaceful, um, as you might even uh, see in the sentence written down by the administrator of the royal palace, who in the... Uh, who wrote about uh, the events uh, a little bit later. When the most sovereign gentleman had left the residence, I shut the windows in the royal palace, helped extinguish the lights, and after the officiant on duty and the footman who had no further instructions had left, I closed all the doors and made my way to the chapel courtyard. Doesn't, doesn't exactly sound like a revolution, although if you might uh, um, believe what Lenin said about a German revolution, and maybe this is true. It was, you know, when you ha when when uh, uh, the revolution takes place, you ask the the people to turn off the lights and be very polite and all that. So, what happened exactly on these days in November in Munich? On the picture on the left, you see 
the Bavaria, which is on the so-called Theresian visa, a place much better known today and also back then for hosting the Oktoberfest. But November, Oktoberfest was uh, over by then. Um, you have um, two demonstrations taking place at the same time. One of the more moderate what they called, they called themselves the majority social democrats, and the others were the a smaller one by the independent social democrats, uh, a group that split from the social democrats in 1917 because they wanted to end the war. They were pacifists and they um, um, wanted Germany to uh, get out of the war. Now, the leader of the independent social democrats in Bavaria was Kurt Eisner, a journalist, an intellectual, a person who had organized a strike of ammunition workers earlier in 1918 and uh, got uh, some, I would say, fame. And for others, of course, he became infamous because he because of this act. But Eisner had the smaller demonstration uh, that night to end the war and start a new government in Germany. The difference was that the larger demonstration, the moderate Social Democrats went home, went to bed, and the next morning they woke up. They woke up in a different state, no longer a monarchy, no longer the Kingdom of Bavaria, but a republic, because Kurt Eisner and his smaller group did not go to sleep. They went on and they went on into the city and they, even to their own surprise, noticed that the soldiers, and there were a lot of soldiers in Munich coming back from the, from the, from the front, they didn't want to fight anymore. And uh, the workers who were in the city, they were, they didn't want to go on with producing more ammunition and, and helping the war effort. And it seemed very easy. Suddenly, uh, he had all of those people behind him. And he founded uh, what was called the uh, Workers, Soldiers, and uh, Farmers uh, Councils, or the Soviet term for the Soviets. But it's not exactly the same. So let's call it councils. And he went and declared the free state of Bavaria. Sometimes in some declarations, also the People's Republic of Bavaria, but it became the Free State of Bavaria, which, by the way, it's called until today, the Free State of Bavaria. Um, he himself was declared um, minister president, would be the prime minister. I, since Bavaria was not an independent state, of course, in America, we might say governor, but it was the, the more literal term is prime minister. And Eisner, whom you see here um, in the middle, was the most unlikely person in many ways. After all, we're talking about Catholic Bavaria. He was a, a, a conservative Bavaria until today. Eisner was a socialist. He was a Prussian. He was born in Berlin. He was a Jew. And in fact, he was the first prime minister, the first leader of any German state ever in history. And, um, sorry. <clears throat> oh, I, sorry, I, I, I understand. Okay. I hope that's easier <laughs> to see. <laughs> yes, yes, um, thank you. So, Kurt, thank you. So Kurt Eisner um, became in a way the hero of those uh, soldiers and workers and the people in the streets of Berlin, eh, sorry, of Munich, including many of the um, of the peasants, the farmers around in 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 the countryside. Um, he declared the republic, and it, it didn't last very long, um, because as you can imagine, I don't know what was more hated the Jew, the Prussian, or the socialist, but he had many enemies in conservative Catholic Munich. And um, one of them, a young person uh, called Count 
uh, Anton Graf von Arco, um, 20 years old, um, assassinated him on February 21st of 1919. Of course, a lot happened between November of 1918 and February of 1921. I cannot go into too many details because we don't have the time for it. Um, but uh, there were also elections because he did not found a council republic, even though he was initially elected by the councils. He um, wanted a parliamentary democratic system, and he called for parliamentary elections, which he lost. His party got only 2.5% all over Bavaria. It was much more successful in the city of Munich, but all over Bavaria, it was a decisive loss. And in fact, he had his resignation letter with him when he went on the street to the Bavarian parliament and was shot on February 21st. Now, there's an interesting little detail about his assassin. Count von Arco, on his father's side, came from a prominent aristocratic Bavarian Austrian family, Catholic. But his mother was a born Oppenheim. And although she was already, her parents already converted to Christianity, it was an old Jewish family. And this Anton von Arco was not allowed to join one of those new rising right-wing extremist um, uh, associations, the Thule Gesellschaft, the Thule Association, probably because he didn't have a pure Aryan heritage. And he tried to prove to his uh, friends on the extreme right that he won't, that he belongs to them uh, by assassinating the Jewish prime minister of a German state. By the way, I said Eisner was the first Jewish prime minister in a German state. He was basically also the last one. Uh, there was a, a tiny exception after him, but until this very day, no German state had really a Jewish prime minister. We can talk about the exception if you want later. Um, he wasn't the only Jew in Bavaria in this time. Among his closest associates already during his time in office, 1918 to early 1919, there were quite a few uh, Jewish friends, um, among them Gustav Landauer, whom you can see uh, to the left uh, in the upper part here, and Ernst Toller, two, and also Erich Mühsam, um, three important um, intellectuals, writers, um, all of them Jewish, none of them from Bavaria, by the way, other, they all came from other parts of Germany. And uh, there are more who are not on this picture. Um, that was a change because not only was there no prime minister or governor in any German state, before 1918, there was not a, not even a minister of a German government uh, before 1918. Uh, so all this came as a novelty in German politics that suddenly Jews, even they are non-religious Jews, um, are now part of the leadership of German um, politics. I also said that Eisner did not get many votes Bavaria-wide in the elections, but the funeral, when after he was assassinated, his funeral in February of 1919 was the largest mass event the city had ever seen. Over 100,000 people marched behind his coffin and the main speech was given by Gustav Landauer, another Jewish leader of the revolution. So what an ironic scene. Imagine Munich, February 1919. One Jewish leader, one Jewish writer, intellectual, gives this morning speech for, the, for another Jewish intellectual who was the prime minister of Bavaria. And interestingly, in the speech itself, he says... The Jew, Kurt Eisner, he doesn't 
you know, just glance over it. He mentions him. The Jew Kurt Eisner, he says, and he stands in the prophet in the tradition of the Old Testament prophets. That's what how he saw um, Kurt Eisner. If you look at both of them with their long beards, they had something themselves of this prophetic tradition. After the assassination, now we're in 1919, there are two, now there are two council republics. Short-lived in March, in April, sorry, in April of 1919, these are some of the leaders of these council republics. Um, the second one then becomes a communist council republics with Eugen Levine, a Russian-born um, uh, Jewish communist. Uh, he's the only communist among all of them, by the way, um, who, again, in all stages, you have Kurt Eisner, the prime minister, you have the leaders of the first council republic, which is not communist, you have the leader of the second council republics. The most prominent names are all Jewish. The whole thing ends with a catastrophe for the revolutionaries. Uh, on May 1st, the whole socialist experiment comes to an end brutally. Now it's no longer a peaceful revolution, but the right-wing forces, um, with the help of the German Reichswehr, the German army um, bring down the second council republic uh, Eugen Levine here to, at the bottom left uh, is uh, exec is uh, executed actually one of the very few political executions uh, in Weimar Germany um Kurt Land uh, uh, sorry um, Gustav Landauer on top is brutally murdered and um Toller and Musam um, are both um, arrested. So this is the end, not only of Bavaria's short-lived socialist experiment, it's also the end, really, of any participation of Jews in Bavarian politics. And if you would ask me who were the ones who really despised the fact that so many Jews were part of the... Um, of this socialist phase in Bavarian politics. Well, of course, the right-wing people, the right-wing organizations, um, no doubt, they killed Eisner and they uh, murdered Landauer and they um, were the ones who brought down the Republic. But the other part of the Munich population that probably also felt very strong antipathy against the Jews in politics, maybe ironically, was the Jewish community of Munich. They were scared. They thought of the saying in Russia where people said the Trotskys make the revolution and the Bronsteins pay the price. Now, Bronstein, of course, was the Jewish, was the original name of Trotsky. And what they meant is the Eisners and the Landauers make the revolution, those Jews from Berlin and from other places, and the Munich Jews will be made responsible for it. And we'll have to pay the price. And in some way, that was the case. Even when Eisner was prime minister, he received letters from Jews from all over Bavaria where they said, well, you should step down. It will only bring anti-Semitism over Bavaria, and we will suffer. And interestingly, Eisner even took the time. I found a few replies in the archives where he replied to them and said, well, I am not never denying I'm Jewish, which is very interesting. But if I would step down, I would listen to those anti-Semites. I would not be myself. I would not be a politician and a socialist politician who wants to, you know, change Bavaria and Germany. But one thing is interesting, in contrast to Trotsky or a Rosa Luxemburg in Berlin, many of those people, Eisner, Toller, Musam, especially Gustav Landauer, they were not only well aware and never denied their Jewishness, 
they were very interested, some of them, in Jewish culture and, of course, secular Jewish thing. Um, Gustav Landauer um, was a very close friend of Martin Buber, the Jewish philosopher. And um, we'll come to this in a moment, but there was really a debate going on within the Jewish community which who rejected these Jewish revolutionaries and the Jewish revolutionaries who didn't deny their Jewishness, but said, we are the real Jews. We do act in the tradition of the prophets of the Bible, and we want social reforms and so on. Here is just a few lines from the leader of Munich's Orthodox Jewish community, Sigmund Frankel, who wrote an open letter in April of 1919 against the socialist Jewish leaders, saying, Bavaria's indigenous Jews shout out by way of me to Bavaria's population. Our hands are clean of the horrors of chaos and of the misery and suffering that your politics must conjure up over Bavaria's future developments. You alone and only you bear, bear the full responsibility for this. So that was one way of distancing himself. And interestingly, that Erich Mühsam, one of the revolutionaries, got to see that letter when it was published. It was only published a year later in the Munich newspaper. And Mühsam, the socialist writer, politician, replied to Frankel and said, you capitalist, he was, a, you know, he, was a, a, he had his own business, you capitalist don't represent the spirit of the Old Testament of the prophets. We, even though we never go to synagogue, we represent the real spirit of Judaism. Now, that's a very, I've never ever seen such a debate among other socialist Jewish leaders. Um, and, and let me just say before we, to the next act, um, let me just say that Martin Buber came to visit Landauer in 1919, um, the very day that Kurt Eisner was assassinated. He was in Munich. And when he left and he heard about it, well, I think on the train out of Munich, he wrote to a friend who later became his son-in-law, saying this whole episode is one big Jewish tragedy. That's how he called the events in Munich at the time. But we can talk more about it. Uh, uh, let me just go one step further. So what happens next in Bavaria and in Munich? There is a new government. For a while, it is a social democratic government. But starting in 19... 20, there is a the most right-wing government in any of the German states, a conservative government. Of course, Hitler, you know, he just enters the scene. He just had uh, renamed the little right-wing party that others had founded into the National Socialist, you know, uh, NSDAP, German uh, uh, Workers' Party. So the Nazi party had just been founded, but there was a right-wing reaction to the revolution. Um, people who, out of often traditional anti-Judaism, traditional Catholic um, rejection of Jewish total equality, um, and anti-socialism, rejected people like Eisner and found his government um, illegitimate. Among them were probably the two most important people in Munich in the early 20s, the archbishop, who soon was to, would become cardinal, Michael Fallhaber. Just uh, recently, actually, we were able to, the, his, his, his diaries were found, and many letters he wrote about it. And in one of them, he says, it's not the same whether the people look up to a king with trust and a sense of religious obligation, or whether they say, what does this Jew have to do with us? So that's kind of the way Fallhaber looked at Eisner, who could not be an authority, a, a political leader, this Russian Jew. 
Um, the other person who was very important both in 1920 and then especially 1923 was the person who became prime minister in 1920, Gustav von Kahr, a mediocre bureaucrat of the German um, bureaucracy. Uh, and um, he was chosen to um, become prime minister at a time when people wanted calm and an end with all the left-wing experiments. Um, and his memoirs, which are over a thousand pages, they're unpublished there in the, in the archive in Munich. Uh, there's a lot of anti-Semitism in there of the more traditional side, of the more traditional kind. Even when he grew up, uh, he describes how his nanny implanted already like anti-Jewish stories to him, but he doesn't say it critically. He clearly uh, did not object to it. Um, and observations like this one, the Bavarian people was letting itself be enticed and terrorized by the Prussian Jew and his clan are found throughout his memoir and other writings. So we see this government actually taking over and they're not Nazis. They are not, you know, radical right wing, but they are very conservative. And within the institutions of Bavaria, you see the first adherents of Hitler's Nazi party getting, making their way in, in the courts. And you see it especially when it comes to the episode, to the trial against the murder the assassin of Kurt Eisner, the 20-year-old von Arco, who is hailed as a hero, a patriot, who wanted to save Bavaria, not only by the judge, not only, of course, by his defender, but even by the prosecutor. And he gets away. First, of course, he has to get death penalty because it's clear he was an assassin. Then he's being, it's reduced to life sentence. And after a few years, he leaves prison in 1923. Um, the police force, and that is perhaps the most important one. The person you see here, this is uh, von Kahr, the prime minister, with, with a person, the police chief of Munich, Perner. Ernst Perner was, the, was one of the earliest associates of Hitler, and he, in 1923, would march with Hitler uh, in the failed Beer Hall Putsch. Um, he becomes the police chief of Munich, uh, already actually 1919. And some others high up in the police will also later identify as Nazis. In fact, the, the head of the political department of the police <clears throat> would later become a minister in Hitler's government in 1933. Um, politics, I already mentioned, Gustav von Kahr, not a Nazi, but someone with clearly anti-Semitic views. And already after he comes to power, becomes prime minister the first time in 1920, what does he do? He wants to expel not all, but a number of East European Jews who don't have German passport and everybody who had the smallest, you know, who, who had a traffic um, offense or anything on record police, now they try to expel of Germany. Sometimes people were born in Germany, but back then you didn't become automatically a citizen if you were um, uh, born in Germany. You see some of the political parties with clearly anti-Semitic images. Um, what about the church? I mentioned Fallhaber, the cardinal. Again, this is kind of the more traditional anti-Semitic atmosphere. And the problem is, where should the Jews go to if they have their complaints? If they can't go to the courts, can't go to the police, can't go to the politicians, they believe they could go to the archbishop and the cardinal. But today we know whenever the rabbi came, uh, the Munich chief rabbi quite often came to the uh, cardinal and asked for protection for the Jewish community. Um, now we know from the diaries that basically what Fallhaber said, well, those wealthy Jews, they can help themselves. They don't need our support. That was basically his line. Um, so where would they go and where would the East European Jews go? 
if they wanted to, not to be expelled, if they wanted to fight against this, this expulsion. Well, it turned out the only institutions they really would, would which really would help them in the city of Munich were the foreign consular were consulates. And I found quite a few interesting documents here in the National Archives in Washington, but also the Austrian, uh, the Bavarian, um, you know, the, 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 the Austrian embassy in Munich in, in the Vienna archives, because they didn't want them. The Viennese and the Polish government, they didn't want to have the Jewish refugees coming from Bavaria. So they basically wrote back and said, well, if you expel our citizens to our country, we will expel Bavarian citizens to Bavaria. And that was the end of the story. Um, and it was in this atmosphere that Adolf Hitler, who you see on the top as a probably around that time, became for the first time Adolf Hitler. He became a politician. We honestly do not know his political views before 1919. It was only in the fall of 1919 that he gave his first speeches and then that he published his first articles. Everything we know from before is hearsay from others or him projecting back to what he thought in Vienna before World War I and so on. So Hitler, who lived in Munich already before World War I, was a soldier during the war, comes back, comes back in the middle of the revolution. He comes back in December of 1918. He notices the Jewish politicians. Later, he says, that's what turned him basically to the politician he became. I don't even know if that's true. He writes that in Mein Kampf, where he makes, he draws a direct line between the rule of the Jews, as he calls it, and the beginning of my political activity. I'm not sure we need to believe it, but it's possible. And in 1920, he founded a Nazi party. And, and sorry, the Nazi party was founded in 1921 and becomes its leader. Um, and then Munich really, and that's the second part of my book, becomes the capital. You know, later it, in 1935, it was Hitler declared it the capital of the movement, of the Nazi movement. But much earlier, I would say it became the capital of anti-Semitism. Um, and Hitler makes clear he wants, and his political experiment, his laboratory was Munich. As he said in 1922, the movement must initially concentrate on one place. It needs to let one city become a model for the rest of the movement. And he said that could only be Munich. Or as he said later, Rome, Mecca, Moscow, each of the three places embodies a worldview. Let us stick with the city that witnessed the first blood sacrifices of our movement. It must become the Moscow of our movement, or the Mecca or Rome, or whatever you want. Already in June of 1923, Thomas Mann, famous writer who lives in Munich, calls in an article which is actually published in English, Munich, he says, is the city of Hitler. That was before his attempt to come to power in the beer hall putsch. And a little later he writes, Munich changed from a center of cheerful sensuality, artistry, and joie de vivre to a city decried as a hotbed of reaction, as the seat of all stubbornness, a city that could only be described as a stupid city, and indeed as the stupidest city of all. You can imagine he lost a few friends in Munich after he wrote this in 1926, but he stayed in Munich until 33. And I come to the end, and I just want to, know, again, we'll go to detail. Hitler rises, as he says, it's the city of Hitler already in June of 1923. That's how many people see it. Hitler is seen everywhere. He has no political function, but the posters of the Nazi party are there. Look at the picture on the top. The huge crowds in the beer halls coming to his speeches. And on November 8th, of 1923, uh, Hitler, sorry, von Kahr, who now is kind of a mini dictator of Bavaria, he's made uh, 
he gives this gets his title of general staatskommissar hard to translate he's a little dictator now with basically dictatorial powers um this von Carr gives a speech in one of the beer halls because when you want a big crowd and crowd in munich you want a beer hall so in the middle of his speech hitler and his supporters storm in pistols in their hand shoot into the ceiling and take von Carr and his associates into an associate into a into an into a room uh, next door. We don't know exactly what happened there, the different accounts, but they come back about a half hour later, and von Carr declares his support for Hitler's revolution. They declare a march on Berlin, following, of course, Mussolini's march on Rome. And um, it seems for a moment that von Carr and the Bavarian government support Hitler in his beer hall putsch, in his attempt to come to power um, in, in at this night, November 1923. Well, the next morning, von Carr changed his mind, or maybe he never changed his mind, because he said, you know, Hitler threatened him with his pistol. That's what he has to say. And that might well be the case. In any case, um, von Karr now sends the police against Hitler and against the Nazis, and it comes to shooting. Some of Hitler's supporters are killed. These are then the first marchers of the National Socialist Movement. Hitler is hurt. He actually dis dislocates his shoulder. Uh, he flees uh, to a nearby lake. He's arrested a little later. And the same judge, by the way, who had this very mild verdict against the assassin of Eisner, against Count Arco, is the judge against Hitler. And again, Hitler is the big patriot. Hitler gets his sentence, but it's a ridiculous sentence for an insurrection. Well, we've heard about this in this country. You don't have to go into detail. Um, the punishment isn't always what it ought to be. Hitler uh, is imprisoned, but he's already... Uh, that the, the, the verdict is spoken on April 1st, 1924. It really is an April fool joke, if you want. And uh, because in December of 1924, he's already a free man again. And of course, comes back to politics. By the way, the scenes during this pogrom in Munich in 1923, the night of November 8th, 9th, it's exactly the same night as 15 years later, 1938, the so-called Kristallnacht or the pogrom night of 1938 takes place. And sometimes if you read the description of 1923 and you don't know it, you think you're ready in 1938. For example, Rachel Strauss, a Jewish physician, one of the first women physician, uh, says all along the ring, they were picking up all Jewish men. We had been spared and we were told tomorrow you'll all be hanging, the entire Jewish community. The street was in a complete uproar. Streicher, the wild anti-Semitic elementary school teacher from Nuremberg, the guy who would edit the Stürmer, this terrible anti-Semitic place, uh, newspaper, was standing on Sendlinger Torplatz and holding a vile inflammatory speech against the Jews. One was one Jew was just walking by. Strike him down, Streicher screamed. You would think you're 1938. No, you're 1923 in Munich, November 8th. And of course, uh, my last picture here, um, uh, the, as I say, the judge really speaks of the pure patriotic spirit and the most noble will Hitler had what, in what he did in 1923. He serves under a year in prison. And the prison isn't the prison. The picture on the top is actually the picture in prison. You don't see, you know, prisons. Uh, it doesn't look like prison. He has his closest associates. You see Rudolf Hess on the right, all around him. He basically, I would call it the writer's retreat. He called, he basically wrote Mein Kampf uh, in those few months in the prison. Um, and what he realizes, and that's really important, he, you know, Munich, remember, Munich is his laboratory. It's an experiment. How far can I go? And he realizes that all his anti-Semitic rhetoric and his attacks against Munich Jews there is no real resistance to them. Um, Jews have no substantial support in the leading circles. 
in politicians, the church, the judges, the clerics, you know, even the population. And of course, a year, a decade later, finally, uh, Hitler um, becomes chancellor of Germany. So if you want to read more, you're welcome to read the book where all this story is written in. But now I would be very happy to answer your question. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, the first question came right in the beginning of your talk. Um, Joseph wants, of course, we now want to know who the tiny exception of another German Jewish prime minister was. <laughs> okay. So to be true, there were, how, depending on how you define, it might be two exceptions. There was another prime minister for shortly, but he was almost unknown, Paul Hirsch in Prussia. Uh, also for a few weeks, basically. But then there was an, one head of a German state in the 1960s in Germany, post-war now, of course, a very different Germany. Uh, it was the mayor of Hamburg, Herbert Weichmann, who came back from America. And Hamburg is a city, of course, but it's also a city, what they call a city state, uh, a, a German state. It's, you know, very small, but... Um, uh, as the mayor of Hamburg, uh, um, there was one other um, Jewish head of state, if you want, in in the over hundred years since since Kurt Eisner. But none of the like bigger states uh, had uh, a Jewish. And you know, even to, in 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 Germany today, since the nine, since basically the late nineteen sixties, there is no member of the German Bundestag or German Parliament in West Germany who was Jewish or identified as Jewish. Of course, there were some who had some Jewish, you know, heritage, but but nobody was a member of a Jewish community or identified as Jewish. Um, so so that's that's um, that was really only the first years of the Weimar Republic. And as you probably all know, the most famous Jewish politician in Weimar Republic uh, was then Foreign Minister Walter Rathenau, who was appointed in early 1922 and a few months later in june of 1922 he was too he was assassinated too and basically he was the last real well-known jewish politician in the weimar republic thank you so john is asking i'm wondering how typical or atypical were the munich and bavarian political forces and events in 1918-19 including the Jewish role of events elsewhere in Germany. Was Munich special? And if so, in what way and why? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yes and no. I mean, you, of course, you had um, you had uh, other Jewish socialists, and the most important one, Rosa Luxemburg, Rosa Luxemburg in Berlin, um, but they didn't come to power. And she was also assassinated in early 1919. Um, there were other socialist experiments, uh, especially in Saxony and Thuringia. Um, but Bavaria was quite different. First of all, it lasted for basically almost half a year, which was longer than most of the than the others. Um, it was also different that I don't think in any other place. There were, there were such a concentration of Jewish people in the leadership, in the political leadership. Maybe the only other place, and I'm not an expert in that, and I don't know Hungarian uh, to be enough, you know, into it, was was Budapest with uh, Bela Kuhn, another, but that was a communist uh, Hungarian Jew, um, and there were quite a few Jewish participants there as well, but in Otherwise, I would say nowhere else. And again, we have to be very careful. Most of those were not communists. Yes, Eugen Levine, the last leader of the last Soviet Republic or Council Republic was, but the others were not. They were, you know, anything from moderate social democrats, and as Eisner actually was. He wasn't the radical at all. For example, he also didn't change the Bavarian bureaucracy. All the people from the monarchy, they basically stayed on. Um, 
to some like anarchists like like Erich Mühsam who who didn't really know what kind of political system they wanted. I think most of them, if not all of them, were not great politicians. Some of them were interesting writers uh, and intellectuals, uh, but the whole experiment failed also because they didn't really know how to govern their state. I think Eisner was pretty pragmatic. Eisner did know, uh, but not none of the others really. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, Does your study address the causes of Hitler's anti-Semitism? I think you mentioned that briefly, but was it simply his following the already well-entrenched anti-Semitism in Germany in the post-war Weimar <clears throat> or in the in the Weimar Republic? Or um what's that? Reason? Yeah, so um sure. I mean, there are so many studies just about this. So my book is not really about Hitler. It's called in Hitler's Munich. But it is more about the Jews in Munich at the time, but right before, in the revolution and up to 1923. Um, but of course, I deal with the question as well. Um, I wouldn't say it's the focus of the book, uh, because there are so many studies on that. And, and they don't all have the same conclusion. And what I find, um, having read quite a few of those, um, it's a lot of it is speculation, especially when it comes to the views of a person, you know, who was a nobody, uh, who nobody reported about Hitler in 1912 or 1915 or even in the summer 1919. Nobody knew who he was. He, he was, you know, whatever we know about him is what people said after they knew who Hitler would become and what he himself projected backwards. Of course, he wanted to project a picture that he was always an anti-Semite, although he did say how important the events in Munich during the revolutions, revolution were for him. So my answer is, in I, I think we'll never have the real full answer. Um, there are even those who assume and who wrote about it, that Hitler was still left-wing in the time of the council republics of Bavaria, because he was nominally part of one of their forces, but it didn't mean much, honestly, in the time. But we don't know. But the fact that you can even write a book on the fact that Hitler was part of some left-wing militia in 1919 uh, tells you how little we really know and how much is possible to speculate about it. What we know exactly is that in the fall of 1919, he was he had very right-wing attitudes and very anti-Semitic attitudes. That started with his first uh, speeches and his first articles. Mm -hmm. um, Alan is asking, how did the press cover this period left and right, such as satirical cartoons mm -hmm. and so on? Great question. And actually, a lot of my book uh, is is about the press. Uh, I mean, a lot. They always see, because I, it's by the way, very interesting because I wrote part of the book in Munich and part of the book in Washington. And I was surprised because so much of the lesser known, there were so many newspapers. And not only, you know, back in the day, the big newspapers didn't appear once a day. They appear twice, sometimes three times a day. Um, so you have a Morgen Ausgabe, a Mittags Ausgabe, an Abend Ausgabe, three editions. <laughs> you can't read, you know, it's, it's it, it, but then there were so many newspapers, little newspapers, and or little known newspapers, and many of them are destroyed in Munich. And I found newspapers from Munich in the national in the uh, Library of Congress, which I didn't find in Munich. So it's very interesting. Um in fact, Munich, so my favorite character in the book, I didn't even mention, um, my favorite character in the book was somebody who actually um, became, who was a Jew who converted and became the main um, editor of the uh, not editor, but kind of the publisher, the person behind the main Munich newspaper, a converted Jew, and he made the newspaper 
uh, basically he, he he converted it into a right wing newspaper um uh, and and was behind some of the worst anti-semitic uh, conspiracy theories like the back in the stab and, and other things uh, he wasn't a Nazi. Of course, he couldn't become a Nazi. He was born a Jew. But he, um, he was an interesting character. So the main Munich newspaper turned to the right. Um, and then there were a lot of other really right-wing papers. The worst, of course, the Nazi paper that was still called the Münchner Beobachter. Later, later it was called the Völkische Beobachter. But then there were some newspapers that were sympathetic to the Jews. Honestly, the one which mostly was, was the Münchner Post, which was the social democratic paper. And they were very, very clear in their, um, in their rejection of anti-Semitism. And uh, that, 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 that was very clear. But many of the others were not. So the, the press is really an interesting, um, Interesting period, interesting mm -hmm. topic. Mm -hmm. um, what, if any, evidence have you found of right-wing Jewish activism, including participation in the Fry course? Anti-Semitic activism, right-wing. Right-wing Jewish. A right-wing Jewish person. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, that's good. So, yes, I, I try, I, I have, so I have chapters, you know, about the left-wing Jewish activists, and then the Munich Jewish community, I would say most of them were somewhere in the middle. Um, there were quite a few monarchists who would have loved the king to stay on, but there were many who were like moderate, moderate left-wing, moderate social democrats, uh, many joined the party in the center, which is called the Deutsche Demokratische Partei, the kind of liberal party. Um, but some were more right wing, yes. And um, there were some Jews who joined the Freikorps, the right wing um, units. Um, not all were welcome, but some Jews clearly joined them. And um, that's one of the points I try to make that Jews were really. Or maybe not equally divided, but they were on all sides of the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. So yeah. now we have a little bit of a an art art historic uh, comment, not a question. I don't know if I can answer uh, that. And then Deborah Browning says, "I know you already know this, but for the sake of our listeners, I want to throw in a relevant little piece of art history." The life-saving delay in the arrest of Ernst Toller on June 5th, 1919, that you uh, refer to in your book, she even gives page number 85, uh, I'm very impressed, was the result of my stepfather-in-law, the painter Hans Reiche, hiding Toller in his flat for two weeks. They were across the hall of Klee's atelier, which was also searched, leading Klee, Klee to flee to Switzerland. Reiche himself served a sentence in the Festung Landsberg, where they gave him materials so that he could paint while their works have survived. So, so interesting. So I knew about Klee, but not about Reiche. So thank you very much. And uh, she asked in another, uh, uh, now she asked the question, could you say something about the role of Hempstänger in Hitler's early rise? Yeah, so uh, Hempstänger, well, he was the one who basically hosted Hitler after he was uh, wounded in 1923. It was his house at the lake, uh, the Amazé, where he fled to. Uh, and... Um, and um, it, um, and, and not the Amazee, sorry, the Staffelsee, where he fled to, and um, and he was an early, you know, it's complicated. Books written about him. He was a student at Harvard. He was very well educated. Was American, you know, Americanized in a way. Came back, became a big supporter of. Hitler, but also the women of the family. That's even more important. Hitler had many women admirers in Munich in the beginning. Um, later, much later, he turned away from Hitler, but he helped him. Um, he was a, a rich uh, family of printers. 
like other wealthy families in Munich, were fascinated by this, you know, person with a very simple background who must have some, you know, charisma, which we probably cannot understand today. Well, there are politicians today whose charisma we many of us don't understand, uh, not naming names. Um, he was a person who was not very, you know, cultivated. He was not, but he was a great speaker to all accounts. He worked on his speaking skills. He had a lot of, took a lot of lessons from actors, how to speak, how to hold his speeches. And, and he influenced a lot of um, people, including wealthy families, established families in Munich, like Hanfteng. Mm -hmm. So... Can you talk about the general atmosphere of anti-Semitism in popular culture in Munich? For instance, yeah. in the in the numerous cabarets and in theater, was the play by S. Engtsky, the Die Book, popular in Munich then? No, I don't think the Die Book, not that I know. But I want to make one thing clear, and I think it comes a little bit late in my presentation, but I hope I made it clear in, in Hitler's Munich in the book. Um, we should not think that there was, you know, this atmosphere of anti-Semitism that captured everything in Munich in the early 20s. It was there, it was visible, and there was no account I read where Jews, even the most marginally connected Jews to, to the Jewish community, would not notice it. Everybody noticed it. In Berlin, in Hamburg, maybe not. In Munich, in the early 20s, Clearly, they did, but did it really? Did did that paint their everyday life? Was that all they experienced every day? No. Many Munich Jews in the early twenties thought, "This is going away. This is one part of the population. We still have support." And it's true, there was support, and not just the foreign embassies, the Social Democrats. Um, and 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 others, you know, Jews still had non-Jewish friends. Uh, some married non-Jewish partners. Uh, they were still part in Jewish clubs. The, you know, probably the most important part of Munich today is FC Bayern München, the football, the soccer club. It was founded among others by Jews. And the president was another Landauer, not related to Gustav Landauer, Kurt Landauer. And when they became champion of the first time of Germany in 1932, they had a Jewish coach and a Jewish president. Of course, a year later, both of them were no longer in their positions in 1933. By 1932, the, the, the club was even called by many a Jews club, the Judenklub. Right, mostly by anti-Semites. So there was also an integration, especially after 1923, after the failed, whatever we call it, insurrection, Beerhold Putsch, after that failed, there was some stability in Munich, as in the whole, whole Germany, and many Jews were quite optimistic then and looked into the future and thought it would get better until the early 30s. So it is complicated and... Um, while there was a lot of anti-Semitism, um, I would say we have to be careful because otherwise we ask ourselves, so why did they all even stay there? Um, and I should say not all stayed. There was a movement of Jews in Munich and Bavaria to leave, not necessarily for America or Palestine or uh, Britain, but to Berlin, to Frankfurt, where they felt safer. And you see this among famous names, not only Jews, also left-wing intellectuals like Bertolt Brecht, but also Leon Feuchtwanger, the very famous uh, Munich-born Jewish writer, um, left for Berlin. And Feuchtwanger actually is a good example. He saw among one of the very first what's happening. He wrote an amazing novel called Success, which was published in 1930, which really depicts the rise of the Nazi movement and Hitler is one of the characters, they have different names, but Hitler is one of the main characters in there. And he came from an Orthodox Jewish family, by the way, uh, a family, I mean, Leon Feuchtwanger came from this family where they would meet, not him, but his father, his grandfather, his 
uncles, they would meet every week after the Shabbat service in the Orthodox synagogue, not the main synagogue with an organ. They went to the Orthodox synagogue. After that, they would have a coffee in the Hofbräu house in the main beer hall of Munich where they had their Stammtisch, their regular table. And of course, they wouldn't pay on Shabbat. They, they were known they would pay the next day. They had their beer there. It was kosher. The Bavarian beer is always kosher. And uh, of course, they wouldn't eat there. But that's how integrated they were. They spoke not just German, they spoke Bavarian. And even after part of the family emigrated to uh, Palestine, Israel later uh, in the 30s, the people would make fun of them because they said, even in your Hebrew and even your prayers, you hear not just the German accent, you hear the Munich Bavarian accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I can see that. Um, time flew by. I have two questions. How many Jews live in Munich today? And ah. did that, did, did, um, how do you feel that this history of the Jewish community in Munich has shaped the way that Jews are viewed in Bavaria today? Oh, okay. So I'll try to make it short because I know uh, time is up, but I am okay if we take a few more minutes. So um, interestingly, today the number of Jews in Munich is about the same as in 1933, uh, maybe a little less, but there were about 12,000 Jews at the height of it, which was the early 20s. A number already declined, as I said, until 33. Um, today there are about 10,000 Jews who are members of the official Jewish community. There are probably others who are not members, but about 10,000. But that number is a relatively recent number because most of them came starting in the 1990s from the former Soviet Union. The Russian speaking, I would say about 75% maybe uh, of the community. And now, of course, also already the second generation. Um, the post-war Jewish community, and that's a whole different chapter, and I've written about this elsewhere, but the whole post-war Jewish community was an interesting phenomenon. There were more Jews in Munich than ever before in 1946, 47, 48. Munich became a center of Jewish DPs, of displaced persons, survivors from East, East European Jews who made their way out of, mainly of, out of Poland, and couldn't go, there was no Israel, and they couldn't go to Palestine, to British Palestine. The Americans didn't let them in. And they ended up in Munich, in the American zone of Germany, also in other parts, of course, but mainly Munich. Some people think they were not at the same time, but between 45 and 1950, about 100,000 Jews who went through Munich, and most of them left. Very few Munich Jews returned to Munich after the war. By the way, also different Hamburg, Berlin, there were more. Munich, very few Jews returned. That may answer your second question. I think Munich was the place where Hitler lived for a long time. It was his center of the movement. Anti-Semitism was very bad in Munich. In I mean, it was very bad everywhere after 33, but especially in Munich. The synagogue, for example, it didn't even stand anymore during so-called Kristallnacht, November 38, because Hitler commanded already in the summer of 1938 to tear it down. That was Munich. Um, few Munich Jews returned, few survived, mainly those married to non-Jewish partners, and rebuilt the community. But in Munich, about from the beginning, about 90% of the Jews who lived in Munich and more were East European Jews after 1945. So there wasn't much continuity. There were Polish Jews, most of them. And after 1990, there were Russian and Ukrainian and Lithuanian Jews and so on. But if you, you come so to Munich, it's yes. interesting, <laughs> don't forget, there is to visit, there is really an impressive um, new modern synagogue inaugurated in 2006 a big Jewish community center, Jewish school. Um, so it's a very, um, quite an active Jewish community, I would say, and very visible. 
which mm -hmm. was not the case until 2006, because until 2006, the main two main synagogues were destroyed. The one that survived was the synagogue that used to be for East European Jews already in the 19, was built in 1930, pretty late, but it was in the backyard. And that's why it survived, because they were afraid to, you know, put this in flames that would endanger the neighboring buildings. But it was invisible. It was in the backyard. Nobody, if you didn't know, would ever see the synagogue. That's very different today, where the synagogue is one of the main squares of Germany, very visible. Very true. I can also only recommend going to, to Munich, going to, to the synagogue uh, uh, and, and experiencing. And there's a Jewish museum also mm -hmm. uh, now in the, in the building. So that's, that's also a very uh, interesting uh, place to visit. Um, thank you so much, Maike. Um, I think everybody, there are so many more questions, um, but we're run out of time. I think everybody, uh, realize that you know so much more than you can say in an hour. So I will, I can only recommend everybody to buy your book and um, we'll send out that uh, the link to, to the book in the follow-up email that we send out. Can I just, I see one question. I just want to see. Okay. Uh, there's so many I couldn't even read, but um, one about the documentation center in Munich. Yes, there mm -hmm. If it's worth visiting, yes, there is an excellent museum. It's called the NS Doku Center, the Doku Center, um, and it documents the whole Nazi past of Munich. It's a big, it's a very interesting museum. I can very much recommend it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All the best to everyone. Thank you.